In September 2008, the bankruptcy of the U.S. investment bank Lehman Brothers and the collapse of the world's largest insurance company, AIG, triggered a global financial crisis. Gripped markets overnight with Asian stocks Stocks fell off a decline. cliff, the largest single point drop in history. Share prices continued to tumble in the aftermath of the Lehman collapse. The result was a global recession, which cost the world tens of trillions of dollars, rendered 30 million people unemployed, and doubled the national debt of the United States. If you look at the cost of it, destruction of equity wealth, of housing wealth, the destruction of income, of jobs, 15 million people globally could end up below the poverty line again. This is just a, a hugely, hugely expensive crisis. This crisis was not an accident. It was caused by an out of control industry. Since the 1980s, the rise of the US financial sector has led to a series of increasingly severe financial crises. Each crisis has caused more damage, while the industry has made more and more money. In 1982, the Reagan administration deregulated savings and loan companies, allowing them to make risky investments with their depositors' money. By the end of the decade, hundreds of savings and loan companies had failed. This crisis cost taxpayers $124 billion and cost many people their life savings. It may be the biggest bank heist in our history. Thousands of savings and loan executives went to jail for looting their companies. One of the most extreme cases was Charles Keating. Mr. Keating, you got a word? In 1985, when federal regulators began investigating him, Keating hired an economist named Alan Greenspan. In this letter to regulators, Greenspan praised Keating's sound business plans and expertise and said he saw no risk in allowing Keating to invest his customers' money. Keating reportedly paid Greenspan $40,000. Charles Keating went to prison shortly afterwards. As for Alan Greenspan, President Reagan appointed him chairman of America's central bank, the Federal Reserve. Greenspan was reappointed by Presidents Clinton and George W. Bush. The next crisis came at the end of the 90s. The investment banks fueled a massive bubble in internet stocks, which was followed by a crash in 2001 that caused $5 trillion in investment losses. The Securities and Exchange Commission, the federal agency which had been created during the Depression to regulate investment banking, had done nothing. In the absence of meaningful federal action, and there has been none, and given the clear failure of self-regulation, it has become necessary for others to step in and adopt the protections needed. Elliot Spitzer's investigation revealed that the investment banks had promoted internet companies they knew would fail. Stock analysts were being paid based on how much business they brought in, and what they said publicly was quite different from what they said privately. Beginning in the 1990s, deregulation and advances in technology led to an explosion of complex financial products called derivatives. Economists and bankers claimed they made markets safer, but instead, they made them unstable. Using derivatives, bankers could gamble on virtually anything. They could bet on the rise or fall of oil prices, the bankruptcy of a company, even the weather. By the late 1990s, derivatives were a $50 trillion unregulated market. In 1998, someone tried to regulate them. Brooksley Bourne graduated first in her class at Stanford Law School and was the first woman to edit a major law review. After running the derivatives practice at Arnold and Porter, Bourne was appointed by President Clinton to chair the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which oversaw the derivatives market. Brooksley Bourne asked me if I would come work with her uh, we decided that this was a serious, potentially destabilizing market. In May of 1998, the CFTC issued a proposal to regulate derivatives. Clinton's Treasury Department had an immediate response. I happened to go into Brooksley's office, and she was just putting down the receiver on her telephone, and the blood had drained from her face. And she looked at me and said, that was Larry Summers. He had 13 bankers in his office. 
and conveyed it in a very bullying fashion, sort of directing her to stop. The banks were now heavily reliant for earnings on these types of activities. And that led to a titanic battle to prevent this set of instruments from being regulated. Shortly after the phone call from Summers, Greenspan, Rubin, and SEC Chairman Arthur Levitt issued a joint statement condemning Bourne and recommending legislation to keep derivatives unregulated. Regulation of derivatives transactions that are privately negotiated by professionals is unnecessary. She was overruled, unfortunately, uh, first by the Clinton administration and then by the Congress. In 2000, uh, Senator Phil Graham took a major role in getting a bill passed that pretty much exempted derivatives from regulation. They are unifying markets. They're reducing regulatory burden. I believe that we need to do it. It is our very great uh, hope that it will be possible to move this year on legislation that in a suitable way goes to create legal certainty for OTC uh, derivatives. Mortgage-backed securities really came into being in the 1980s. They started as a really good idea, which made a lot of sense, which was a way to take mortgages, package them up, and sell off the cash flows. So an investor would buy a portion of all these mortgages, and the mortgages would pay that investor. And the idea was that made investing in mortgages much less risky, because instead of investing in just me, you were investing in a 1,000 people. 30 years ago, if you went to get a loan for a home, the person lending you the money expected you to pay him or her back. You got a loan from a lender who wanted you to pay him back. We've since developed securitization, whereby the people who make the loan are no longer at risk if there's a failure to repay. In the old system, when a homeowner paid their mortgage every month, the money went to their local lender. And since mortgages took decades to repay, lenders were careful. In the new system, Lenders sold the mortgages to investment banks. The investment banks combined thousands of mortgages and other loans, including car loans, student loans, and credit card debt, to create complex derivatives called collateralized debt obligations, or CDOs. The investment banks then sold the CDOs to investors. Now when homeowners paid their mortgages, the money went to investors all over the world. The investment banks paid rating agencies to evaluate the CDOs, and many of them were given a triple A rating, which is the highest possible investment grade. This made CDOs popular with retirement funds, which could only purchase highly rated securities. This system was a ticking time bomb. Lenders didn't care anymore about whether a borrower could repay, so they started making riskier loans. The investment banks didn't care either. The more CDOs they sold, the higher their profits. And the rating agencies, which were paid by the investment banks, had no liability if their ratings of CDOs proved wrong. In the early 2000s, there was a huge increase in the riskiest loans, called subprime. But when thousands of subprime loans were combined to create CDOs, many of them still received AAA ratings. Now, it would have been possible to create derivative products that don't have these risks, mm -hmm. that carry the equivalent of deductibles, where there are limits on the risks that can be taken on and so forth. They didn't do that, did they? They didn't do that, and in retrospect, they should have done. So did these guys know that they were doing something dangerous? I think they did. On Wall Street, annual cash bonuses spiked. Traders and CEOs became enormously wealthy during the bubble. Lehman Brothers was a top underwriter of subprime lending, and their CEO, Richard Fuld, took home $485 million. On Wall Street, this housing and credit bubble 
was leading to hundreds of billions of dollars of profits. You know, by 2006, about 40% of all profits of S&P 500 firms was coming from financial institutions. It wasn't real profits, it wasn't real income, it was just money that was being created by the system and booked as income two, three years down the road. There's a default, it's all wiped out. I think it was, in fact, in retrospect, a great big national, and not just national, global Ponzi scheme. Through the Home Ownership and Equity Protection Act, the Federal Reserve Board had broad authority to regulate the mortgage industry. But Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan refused to use it. During the bubble, the investment banks were borrowing heavily to buy more loans and create more CDOs. The ratio between borrowed money and the bank's own money was called leverage. The more the banks borrowed, the higher their leverage. In 2004, Henry Paulson, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, helped lobby the Securities and Exchange Commission to relax limits on leverage, allowing the banks to sharply increase their borrowing. The SEC somehow decided to let investment banks gamble a lot more. That was nuts. I don't know why they did that, but they did that. Derivatives. It's where the really big money is made. I'm going to propose here a micron swap. Derivatives can be many things, but are basically contracts or bets that derive their value from the performance of something else. An interest rate, a bond or stock, a loan, a currency, a commodity, virtually anything. For traders, derivatives are a perfect product. A derivative is something can be made up, uh, crafted right on the trading floor and sold the next day. Absolutely. Most derivatives, you don't need to have them in warehouse, you don't need to find them, to sell them, you just can create them. They are also very profitable. I would say probably two-thirds of the trading revenues was directly or indirectly associated with derivatives. So it's not exaggeration to say that trading of derivatives was really the lifeblood of the banks. Yes, I think it's fair to say. There was a phrase, uh, ripping someone's face off, that was used on the trading floor to describe when you sold something to a client who didn't understand it and you were able to extract a massive fee because they didn't understand it. And the idea was that this was a good thing because what you were doing was making more money for the bank. And that sort of spirit of being antagonistic to your client actually took on a significant life uh, on Wall Street. There was another ticking time bomb in the financial system. AIG, the world's largest insurance company, was selling huge quantities of derivatives called credit default swaps. For investors who owned CDOs, credit default swaps worked like an insurance policy. An investor who purchased a credit default swap paid AIG a quarterly premium. If the CDO went bad, AIG promised to pay the investor for their losses. But unlike regular insurance, speculators could also buy credit default swaps from AIG in order to bet against CDOs they didn't own. In insurance, you can only insure something you own. Let's say you and I own property, I own a house. I can only insure that house once. The derivatives universe essentially enables anybody to actually insure that house. So you could insure that, somebody else could do that, so 50 people might insure my house. So what happens is, if my house burns down, now the number of losses in the system becomes proportionately larger. Since credit default swaps were unregulated, AIG didn't have to put aside any money to cover potential losses. Instead, AIG paid its employees huge cash bonuses as soon as contracts were signed. But if the CDOs later went bad, AIG would be on the hook. People were essentially being rewarded for taking massive risks in good times that generate short-term revenues and profits and therefore bonuses, but that's going to lead to the firm to be bankrupt over time. That's a totally distorted system of compensation. AIG's Financial Products Division in London issued $500 billion worth of credit default swaps during the bubble, many of them for CDOs backed by subprime mortgages. The 400 employees at AIG FP made $3.5 billion between 2000 and 2007, 
Joseph Cassano, the head of AIGFP, personally made $315 million. This Goldman Sachs issue of securities, it was a complete disaster. Borrowers had borrowed on average 99.3% of the price of the house, which means they have no money in the house. If anything goes wrong, they're gonna walk away from the mortgage. This is not a loan you'd really make, right? You've gotta be crazy. But somehow you took 8,000 of these loans. And by the time the guys were done at Goldman Sachs and the rating agencies, two thirds of the loans were rated AAA, which meant they were rated as safe as government securities. It, it's utterly mad. Goldman Sachs sold at least $3.1 billion worth of these toxic CDOs in the first half of 2006. The CEO of Goldman Sachs at this time was Henry Paulson, the highest paid CEO on Wall Street. Good morning, welcome to the White House. I'm pleased to announce that I will nominate Henry Paulson to be the Secretary of the Treasury. He's a lifetime of business experience. He has an intimate knowledge of financial markets. He's earned a reputation for candor and integrity. You might think it would be hard for Paulson to adjust to a meager government salary. But taking the job as Treasury Secretary was the best financial decision of his life. Paulson had to sell his $485 million of Goldman stock when he went to work for the government. But because of a law passed by the first President Bush, he didn't have to pay any taxes on it. It saved him $50 million. The article came out in October of 2007. Already a third of the mortgages defaulted. Now, uh, most of them are gone. One group that had purchased these now worthless securities was the Public Employees Retirement System of Mississippi which provides monthly benefits to over 80,000 retirees. They lost millions of dollars and are now suing Goldman Sachs. By late 2006, Goldman had taken things a step further. It didn't just sell toxic CDOs. It started actively betting against them at the same time it was telling customers that they were high quality investments. By purchasing credit default swaps from AIG, Goldman could bet against CDOs it didn't own and get paid when the CDOs failed. I asked if anybody called the customers and said, you know, we don't really like this kind of mortgage anymore, and we thought you ought to know. And, you know, th they didn't really say anything, but, you know, you just feel the laughter coming over the phone. Goldman Sachs bought at least $22 billion of credit default swaps from AIG. It was so much that Goldman realized that AIG itself might go bankrupt. So they spent $150 million insuring themselves against AIG's potential collapse. Then in 2007, Goldman went even further. They started selling CDOs specifically designed so that the more money their customers lost, the more money Goldman Sachs made. $600 million of Timberwolf securities is what you sold. Before you sold them, this is what your sales team were telling to each other. Boy, that Timberwolf was one shitty deal. This was an email to me in late June. Right. And you sold Timberwolf. Transaction. No, no. You sold Timberwolf after as well. W we did trades after that. Yeah. Okay. The next email, take a look, July 107, tells the sales force the top priority is Timberwolf. Your top priority to sell is that shitty deal. If you have an adverse interest to your client, you have the duty to disclose that to your client to tell that client of your adverse interest. That's my question. Sure, Mr. Chairman, I'm just trying to understand. No, I think you understand that I don't means. think you want to answer. Do you believe that you have a duty to act in the best interests of your clients? Again, uh, Senator, I, I will repeat, you know, we have uh, a duty to, to serve our clients by showing prices on transactions that they ask us to show prices for. What do you think about selling securities which your own people think are crap 
Does that bother you? I think they would, again, as a hypothetical. No, you know, this is real. Well, then I don't. We heard it today. Well, we heard it today. This is a shitty deal. This is crap. I, I, I heard nothing today that makes me think anything um, went wrong. Is there not a conflict when you sell something to somebody and then are determined to bet against that same security and you don't disclose that to the person you're selling it? In the you see a problem? In the context of market making, that is not a conflict. And when you heard that your employees in these emails said, God, what a shitty deal. God, what a piece of crap. Do you feel anything? I, th I think that's very unfortunate to have on email. Are you embarrassed? And, and and very unfortunate. I don't. I don't on again, emails, please, and please don't take that. How about mic. feeling that way? I think it's very unfortunate for anyone to have said that in any form. Is it your understanding that your competitors were engaged in similar activities? Uh, yes, and, and to a greater extent than us in most cases. would have thought that pension funds would have said, those are subprime, why am I buying them? And they had these guys at Moody's and Standard & Poor's who said that's a triple A. None of these securities got issued without the imprimatur, you know, the good housekeeping seal of approval of the rating agencies. The three rating agencies, Moody's, S&P, and Fitch, made billions of dollars giving high ratings to risky securities. Moody's, the largest rating agency, quadrupled its profits between 2000 and 2007. Moody's and S&P get compensated based on putting out ratings reports, and the more structured securities they gave a AAA rating to, the higher their earnings were going to be for the quarter. Imagine if you went to the New York Times and you said, look, if you write a positive story, I'll pay you $500,000. But if you don't, I'll give you nothing. The rating agencies could have stopped the party and said, we're sorry, you know, we're going to tighten our standards. This is, and, and immediately cut off a lot of the flow of funding to risky borrowers. AAA rated instruments mushroomed from just a handful to thousands and thousands. Hundreds of billions of dollars uh, were being rated. Um, you know, and per year. Per year, oh yeah. I've now testified before both houses of Congress on the credit rating agency issue and both times, they trot out very prominent First Amendment lawyers and argue that when we say something is rated AAA, that is merely our opinion. You shouldn't rely on it. S&P's ratings express our opinion. Our ratings are uh, uh, our opinions. They're opinions. Opinions, and those are they are just opinions. I think we are emphasizing the fact that our ratings are uh, uh, our opinions. have so many economists coming on our air and saying, oh, this is a bubble and it's going to burst and this is going to be a real issue for the economy. Some say it could even cause a recession at some point. What is the worst case scenario if, in fact, we were to see prices come down substantially across the country? Well, I, I guess I don't buy your premise. It's a pretty unlikely possibility. We've never had a decline in house prices on a nationwide, a nationwide basis. Ben Bernanke became chairman of the Federal Reserve Board in February 2006, the top year for subprime lending. But despite numerous warnings, Bernanke and the Federal Reserve Board did nothing. Robert Gnaizda met with Ben Bernanke and the Federal Reserve Board three times after Bernanke became chairman. Only at the last meeting did he suggest that there was a problem and that the government ought to look into it. When? When was that? What year? It's 2009, March 11th in DC. This year? This year we met, yes. And so for the two previous years you met him, even in 2008? Yes. The shaky housing market starting to crack at the foundation. Particularly hard-hit markets, Miami, Vegas, Northern Virginia, and right here in D.C. Historically, house prices have been somewhat disconnected across different parts of the country, but this housing bubble did end up being national, and it did have implications for the whole economy. The real estate bubble, everybody knows, has burst. This is the hangover after the great frat party you went to. House prices started to fall. 
The economy started to slow. Those adjustable rate mortgages are now coming due. People who had bought these adjustable rate mortgages, when they started to reset, they couldn't afford to make the higher payments. They tried to refinance them. But their house prices declined in value, so they couldn't refinance them. Foreclosures are up over a thousand percent. Some people start defaulting on their mortgage payments. And now that begins to ripple through. It was a very, very bad. A lot of people lost their homes. A lot of people lost their savings. Those falling home prices are like an infection now spreading throughout the U.S. economy. The system's not designed to function in an environment where house prices are going down. So these mortgage-backed securities start to unravel, and you got problems. By 2008, home foreclosures were skyrocketing, and the securitization food chain imploded. Lenders could no longer sell their loans to the investment banks, and as the loans went bad, dozens of lenders failed. Chuck Prince of Citibank famously said that uh, uh, we have to dance until the music stops. Actually, the music had stopped already when he said that. The market for CDOs collapsed, leaving the investment banks holding hundreds of billions of dollars in loans, CDOs, and real estate they couldn't sell. When the crisis started, uh, both the Bush administration and the uh, and the Federal Reserve were totally behind the curve. They did not understand the extent of it. At what point do you remember thinking for the first time, this is dangerous, this is bad? I remember very well uh, one, um, I think it was a G7 meeting of February 2008. And I remember discussing the issue with, with Hank Paulson. And I clearly remember telling Hank, we are watching this tsunami coming and you just proposing that we ask which swimming costume we're going to put on. What was his response? What was his feeling? Things are pretty much under control. Yes, we are looking at uh, this situation carefully and uh, yeah, it's under control. We're gonna keep growing, okay? And obviously, I'll, I'll say it, if, if, you're keep, keep, if you're growing, you're not in recession, right? I mean, we, we, we all know that. When AIG was bailed out, the owners of its credit default swaps, the most prominent of which was Goldman Sachs, were paid $61 billion the next day. Paulson, Bernanke, and Tim Geithner forced AIG to pay 100 cents on the dollar rather than negotiate lower prices. Eventually, the AIG bailout cost taxpayers over $150 billion. $160 billion went through AIG 14 billion went to Goldman Sachs. At the same time, Paulson and Geithner forced AIG to surrender its right to sue Goldman and the other banks for fraud. Isn't there a problem when the person in charge of dealing with this crisis is the former CEO of Goldman Sachs, someone who had a major role in causing it? Well, I think it's fair to say that the financial markets today are incredibly complicated. So Kirsten has a bag, let's say, of garbage. Let's just say it's trash. And nobody wants to buy all of Bear Stearns and the trash. Jamie Dimon says, I'll buy Bear Stearns, but you guys are gonna have to share the trash with me. You, Tim Geithner and Ben Bernanke and Hank Paulson, you gotta take the trash out. It would be like Fox bailing out NBC. J.P. Morgan Chase joins the Federal Reserve in a frantic attempt to rescue Bear Stearns. That was very controversial because that was, in essence, the first proto-bailout. People woke up on Monday and, and thought that it was the heist of the century. People thought Jamie had stolen Bear, and people thought that Hank had basically given away the store by taking on $30 billion of terrible crapola. And that was the beginning of this debate in the country about what was what was happening, how bad it was going to be, and whether we should, whether we should be doing any of this. Communication was a really tough issue during the crisis. None of us were able to convince the public that what we did was not for Wall Street, but it was for the American people. Wall Street. Wall Street. 
We were a few days away from the ATMs not working. I could see the crisis spreading very, very quickly from Wall Street to Main Street. That week, one of the largest McDonald's franchisees in the country calls Ken Wilson, who's working for Hank Paulson in the Treasury, and literally says to him, I don't think I'm going to be able to make payroll next week. Think about that. And you might say, so why couldn't McDonald's do this? Well, guess what? They rely on Bank of America to roll their paper, and they're worried the Bank of America is not going to do it. Usually, the Secretary of Treasury keeps me posted on the markets. But I haven't heard from him in a couple of weeks. In that amount of time, we've had Lehman Brothers, Merrill Lynch, and then AIG. So I called him, it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon, to say, can you be here 9 o'clock the next morning? To which he said, Madam Speaker, tomorrow morning will be too late. So we planned a meeting for 5 o'clock that day. Hank Paulson and uh, Chairman Bernanke came in. And Chairman Bernanke uh, said to the group, if you don't give Hank Paulson what he needs, within 72 hours, the entire banking system in the United States will fail, and then the world banking system will fail on top of it. One of the most sobering periods I've ever experienced. You gotta be kidding. I mean, wh why are we first meeting now? We've got 72 hours. If anything, I think I might have understated in my predictions how bad things were actually going to get. Why are we asked to put $700 billion to keep CEOs in their office while families get kicked out of their homes? Why do we have one week to determine $700 billion that has to be appropriated or this country's financial systems go down the pipes? I share the outrage that people have. It's, it's embarrassing. Uh, to, to, to look at this, and I think it's embarrassing for the United States of America. Their view is, right, same as all of our view is, if you take risk and you make money, that's fine, great for you. But if you lose money, we don't expect the United States of America to be there to save you. Anything that looks like a bailout is unpopular. The men who destroyed their own companies and plunged the world into crisis walked away from the wreckage with their fortunes intact. The top five executives at Lehman Brothers made over a billion dollars between 2000 and 2007. And when the firm went bankrupt, they got to keep all the money. Two of AIG's former CEOs were grilled about a retreat where only a week after being bailed out by taxpayers, its executives spent $440,000 on oceanfront rooms, rounds of golf, and trips to the resort spa and salon. They were getting their manicures, their facials, their pedicures, and their massages while the American people were, were footing the bill. The government privatized Iceland's three largest banks. The result was one of the purest experiments in financial deregulation ever conducted. <laughs> Finance took over um, and uh, more or less wrecked the place. In a five-year period, these three tiny banks, which had never operated outside of Iceland, borrowed $120 billion, 10 times the size of Iceland's economy. The bankers showered money on themselves, each other, and their friends. There was a massive bubble. Stock prices went up by a factor of nine. Well, house prices more than doubled. Iceland's bubble gave rise to people like Jan Asger Johannesson. He borrowed billions from the banks to buy up high-end retail businesses in London. He also bought a pinstriped private jet, a $40 million yacht, and a Manhattan penthouse. Newspapers always had the headline, this millionaire bought this company uh, in the UK or in Finland or in, in France or wherever, uh, instead of saying this millionaire took a billion dollar loan to buy this company and he took it from your local bank. The banks set up money market funds and the banks advised deposit holders to withdraw money and put them in the money market funds. The Ponzi scheme needed everything it could. Huh? American accounting firms like KPMG 
audited the Icelandic banks and investment firms and found nothing wrong. And American credit rating agencies said Iceland was wonderful. In February 2007, the rating agency decided to upgrade the banks to the highest possible rate, AAA. It went so far as the government here traveling with the bankers as a, as, as a PR show. When Iceland's banks collapsed at the end of 2008, unemployment tripled in six months. There is nobody unaffected in Iceland. So a lot of people here lost their savings. Yes, that's the case. The government regulators who should have been protecting the citizens of Iceland had done nothing. You have two lawyers from the regulator going down to a bank to talk about some issue. When they approached the bank, they would see 19 uh, SUVs outside, <laughs> outside the bank, right? So you enter the bank and you have the 19 lawyers sitting uh, in front of you, right? Very, very well prepared, uh, uh, ready to kill any argument you make. And then if you do really well, they'll offer you a job, right? One third of Iceland's financial regulators went to work for the banks. But this is a universal problem. Huh? In New York, you have the same problem, right? Frederick Mishkin, who returned to Columbia Business School after leaving the Federal Reserve, reported on his federal disclosure report that his net worth was between $6 million and $17 million. In 2006, you co-authored a study of Iceland's financial right. system. Right. Iceland is also an advanced country with excellent institutions, low corruption, rule of law. The economy has already adjusted to financial liberalization, while prudential regulation supervision is generally quite strong. Yeah, and that was the mistake. That turns out that, uh, that the prudential regulation and supervision was not strong in Iceland. And particularly so what during led you period, to think that it was? I think that uh, you're going with the information you had, and, and generally uh, the view was that that, uh, that Iceland had very good institutions. It was a very advanced country. Who and they told were not... you that? Who did, what kind of well, research did you, you do? You talk to people, you have faith in, in uh, the central bank, which actually did fall down on the job, uh, that uh, clearly at this... Uh, Why do you uh, have faith in a central bank? Well, that faith, you, you, because you go with the information you have. How much were you paid to write it? I was paid, uh, I think the number was, uh, it's public information. On your CV, the title of this report has been changed from financial stability in Iceland to financial instability in Iceland. Oh, well, I don't know. Whatever it is, is the other thing. If it's a typo, there's a typo. Did you participate in these semi-annual meetings that uh, Robert Gneista and, and uh, Greenlining had with the Federal Reserve Board? Yes, I did. I was actually on the committee that, uh, that was involved, involved with that, the Consumer Community Affairs Committee. He warned in an extremely explicit manner about what was going on, and he came to the Federal Reserve Board with loan documentation of the kind of loans that were frequently being made, and he was listened to politely, and nothing was done. Right. So, again, I I don't know the details in terms of of uh, of. Um, uh, in fact, I, I just don't. I, I whatever information he provided, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, uh, it's, it's actually, to be honest with you, I can't remember th th this kind of discussion, but certainly uh, there, w there were issues that were uh, uh, coming up, but then the question is, how pervasive are they? Why didn't you try looking? I think that people did. We had people look, we had a whole group of people looking at this for whatever reason. you can't be serious. If you would have looked, you would have found things. Uh, you know, that's very, very easy to always say that you can always find it. As early as 2004, the FBI was already warning about an epidemic of mortgage fraud. They reported inflated appraisals, doctored loan documentation, and other fraudulent activity. In 2005, the IMF's chief economist, Raghuram Rajan, warned that dangerous incentives could lead to a crisis. Governor Fred Mishkin is resigning, effective August 31. He says he plans to return to his teaching post at Columbia's Graduate School of Business. Why did you leave the Federal Reserve in August of 2008? I'm in, in the middle of the worst financial so, crisis. So uh, that uh, I had to, to revise a textbook. 
His departure leaves the Fed board with three of its seven seats vacant, just when the economy needs it most. Well, I'm sure your textbook is important and widely read, but in August of 2008, you know, some somewhat more important things were going on in the world, don't you think? It's gaining momentum across the country. Last fall, as the European debt crisis worsened, Occupy Wall Street launched its protests in New York. I remember sending an email to my boss asking, is anybody watching? Does anybody care about this? What, the protests? No. That was the response, you know? I mean, it just wasn't an issue. When I first saw Occupy Wall Street, I was highly skeptical. And I just thought it would be shut down on day one, like I think most people did. And then they had this momentum. Several hundred people packed into Bowling Green Park in Lower Manhattan for what they're calling an Occupy Wall Street demonstration. People are definitely getting screwed over right now and getting hurt by a lot of the powers that be, and we want to see a change in that. People struggling to pay their mortgages, incomes that haven't gone up all this strain, and people at the very top walking off, acting like their shit doesn't stink. Since 2000, you've taken home more than $480 million. Are these figures basically accurate? I would assume they are. And that whole attitude is that people think that there are two rule books, one for the elite and one for everybody else. And that started off a populist revolt. Instead, let's reduce the 311 million Americans to just a representative 100 people. Make it simple. Here they are, teachers, coaches, firefighters, construction workers, engineers, doctors, lawyers, some investment bankers, a CEO, maybe a celebrity or two. Now let's line them up according to their wealth. Poorest people on the left, wealthiest on the right, just a steady row of folks based on their net worth. We'll color code them like we did before based on which 20% quintile they fall into. Now, let's reduce the total wealth of the United States, which was roughly $54 trillion in 2009, to this symbolic pile of cash. And let's distribute it among our 100 Americans. Well, here's socialism, all the wealth of the country distributed equally. We all know that won't work. We need to encourage people to work and work hard to achieve that good old American dream and keep our country moving forward. So. Here's that ideal we asked everyone about. Something like this curve. This isn't too bad. We've got some incentive as the wealthiest folks are now about 10 to 20 times better off than the poorest Americans. But hey, even the poor folks aren't actually poor since the poverty line has stayed almost entirely off the chart. We have a super healthy middle class with a smooth transition into wealth. And yes, Republicans and Democrats alike chose this curve. Nine out of 10 people, 92%, said this was a nice, ideal distribution of America's wealth. But let's move on. This is what people think America's wealth distribution actually looks like. Not as equitable, clearly, but for me, even this still looks pretty great. Yes, the poorest 20 to 30% are starting to suffer quite a lot compared to the ideal, and the middle class is certainly struggling more than they were, while the rich and wealthy are making roughly a hundred times that of the poorest Americans and about ten times that of the still healthy middle class. Sadly, this isn't even close to the reality. Here is the actual distribution of wealth in America. The poorest Americans don't even register. They're down to pocket change. And the middle class is barely distinguishable from the poor. In fact, even the rich between the top 10 and 20 percentile are worse off. Only the top 10% are better off. And how much better off? So much better off that the top 2 to 5% are actually off the chart at this scale. And the top 1%, this guy, well his stack of money stretches 10 times higher than we can show. Here's his stack of cash, restacked, all by itself. This is the top 1% we've been hearing so much about. So much green in his pockets that I have to give him a whole new column of his own because he won't fit on my chart. 1% of America has 40% of all the nation's wealth. The bottom 80%, 8 out of every 10 people, or 80 out of these 100, 
only has 7% between them. And this has only gotten worse in the last 20 to 30 years. While the richest 1% take home almost a quarter of the national income today, in 1976, they took home only 9%, meaning their share of income has nearly tripled in the last 30 years. The top 1% own half the country's stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. The bottom 50% of Americans own only half a percent of these investments, which means they aren't investing. They're just scraping by. I applied to work at a hedge fund, D.E. Shaw, and I got the job, and I thought this was great. I was a quant. A quant uses um, statistical methods to try to predict patterns in the market. Her work was used to predict when big pension funds would buy or sell so the firm could jump in ahead of their trades. I just felt like I was doing something immoral. I, just, I was taking advantage of people I don't even know whose retirements were in these funds. We all put money into our 401ks. And Wall Street takes this money and just skims off like a certain percentage every quarter. At the very end of somebody's career, they retire and they get some of that back. This is this person's money and it's just basically going to, to Wall Street. Bank of America's CEO, Ken Lewis, was in the spotlight. His bank had taken more than $45 billion in government bailouts. It was clear we were there to take a public whipping and, and, and we did. I just tried to think of it that way and think of it as, you know, this too will pass and just get through it. There has been uh, wide speculation that some of our larger banks around the nation may end up uh, being uh, nationalized. Do you feel that your bank should be considered one of those banks at risk? Are you talking to me? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, absolutely not. I don't know why you would ask the question. And many worry the serious problems are still out there. What we have done is institutionalized too big to fail. And in many respects, one crisis sows the seeds of the next crisis, and I'm afraid the next one could be even larger. The three pieces that we really had to get right, too big to fail, risky investments, derivatives, it, it isn't a matter of, of opinion. Those three things are three things that we really haven't solved. Uh, and and uh, therefore, until those are solved, uh, we haven't dealt with the problem. Here we are three years plus after, and very little has changed. In many respects, the financial crisis never ended. It, it never ended. People seem to think about this financial crisis as one in which there was a, a run up to September 2008, a bailout, and then the crisis passed. But in fact, those clouds are still hanging over the global economy, and they're still filled with risk. This crisis really never ended. We have known for generations that banks are susceptible to runs. Banks can't function if everybody comes and wants their money at the same moment. I think you've got to think of the unintended consequences of taking a public that has more full faith and confidence in the banking system than maybe people in this room do, <laughs> that we want them to have full faith and confidence in the banking system. They know the FDIC insurance is there. They know it works. They put their money in. They're going to get their money out. So there, there's a select crowd of people that are in the institutional side. And if they want to understand this, they're going to find a way to understand this. There's a bunch of law firms represented in this room. There's a bunch of people that will charge them by the hour a lot of money to explain this all to them. And, and, and it's fine. I, I, don't have a, I don't have a problem with that. And they all have huge staffs. But I would be careful about the unintended consequences of starting to blast too much of this out in the general public. For the EFT, Mr. Bloom has two minutes. Uh, well, uh, Commissioner, um, Mr. President, uh, I rise again, I'm afraid, to make the same old hoary speech that I've been making here for several years, and that is, it is my opinion that you do not really understand the concept of banking. All the banks are broke, uh, Bank Santander, Deutsche Bank, Royal Bank of Scotland, they're all broke. And why are they broke? It isn't an act of God. It isn't some sort of tsunami. They're broke because we have a system called fractional reserve banking, which means that banks can lend money that they don't actually have. It's a criminal scandal, and it's been going on for too long. To add to that problem, 
you have moral hazard a very significant moral hazard from the political sphere and most of the problem starts in politics and central banks which are part of the same political system we have counterfeiting sometimes called quantitative easing but counterfeiting by any other name the artificial printing of money which if any ordinary person did they'd go to prison for a very long time and yet governments and central banks do it all the time central banks repress the amount of interest that rate, rates are so we don't have the real cost of money and yet we blame the real retail banks for manipulating LIBOR the sheer effrontery of this is quite astonishing it's central banks it's central banks that manipulate interest rates commissioner and plus underneath all this we talk loosely in a rather cavalier fashion do we not about deposit guarantees so when banks go broke through their own incompetence and chicanery the taxpayer picks up the tab it's theft from the taxpayer and until we start sending bankers and i include central bankers and politicians to prison for this outrage it will continue Every day while you're out working hard just to scrape by, Wall Street insiders are exploiting a flaw in the financial system to commit the perfect crime. They are selling stock that doesn't exist. When I first heard the term naked short selling, I had no clue as to what they were mentioning. Illegal naked short selling is the practice of selling stock you don't own getting paid for it, and then never delivering the shares. We thought to ourselves, that's impossible. That can't be. The government oversees this. It's a bigger problem than I ever anticipated. People were losing their jobs. People were losing their families. Have you ever heard of naked short selling? Naked short selling? Naked short selling is, is it's stock counterfeiting. The sheer volume is astounding. On any given day, there are between 500 million and 1 billion shares that have been sold and failed to deliver. And that can force a stock's price to plummet. Over the course of uh, seven, eight, nine months, the stock went from $8 per share till it ultimately reached two cents. Illegal naked short selling has driven thousands of companies into the ground. This is a crack in our market that could bring down the country. And it's still going on. And if we're not outraged by it, then frankly, we deserve what we get. Normally, when you sell something, you have to either own it or borrow it, and you have to deliver it. You get paid for it, you gotta deliver what you paid for. In a naked short sale, the naked short seller never delivers the shares. The seller sold something they didn't own, the buyer thinks they own something they don't, and the buyer parted with good money to the seller. It has the effect of making it seem as if there are more shares than actually exist. And that can drive a company's stock into the ground. As far back as United Airlines, at the turn of the century to GameStop and AMC more recently, the practice of naked shorting has wiped out the savings of many hardworking Americans. It has destroyed their pensions and eliminated their jobs. From pilots to bag handlers to grocers, technologists, and scientists working on life-saving medications as you've heard about today from biotech companies, Naked short selling creates a deteriorating financing capability for the underlying company, and it helps drive the toxic lending environment that dominates the microcap space. And who pays the price? Unchecked, it can be a death sentence for a company, irrespective of the company's intrinsic value. I know it nearly killed my company. Here we are on the verge of 2023, and still, no one in authority has fully addressed the issue. Over the last few decades, what was once a discreet handshake between a few stock loan departments has turned into an institutionalized, technology-driven, money-making machine. And it does not matter that they get fined millions or even a few billion. They treat it as a line item. It's just another cost of doing business. We believe somebody's selling stock that doesn't exist. We thought to ourselves, that's impossible.
that can't be. The SEC oversees this. The DTC oversees this. The government oversees this. Wes Christian and John O'Quinn were looking at a case of naked short selling, where stock is sold short but never borrowed, creating what is known in the market as a fail to deliver. It's a situation where stock is sold to a buyer, but the broker never delivers the shares. The fail to deliver in 1993 was about $1.6 billion total. By 2003, it was $6 billion. Over the centuries, investors have learned many tricks to drive stocks both up and down. One of the newest ways to drive them down, and you can make lots of money doing that, is with an obscure Wall Street trading tactic called naked short selling. In a normal short sale, an investor borrows shares and sells them. If the price falls, he profits by replacing those borrowed shares with cheaper ones. But in a naked short sale, an investor fails to deliver the shares because he doesn't borrow them. A loosely organized group of people who are destroying small companies and looting the savings of America. Gather around. We're doing our morning meeting this afternoon. Come on in. Meet Patrick Byrne, the outspoken CEO of Overstock.com, an internet retailer based in Salt Lake City that went public in May 2002. For the past two years, Byrne has been complaining that naked shorting has driven down share prices in thousands of small public companies, including his own, by permitting the sale of stock that, in some cases, doesn't exist. I don't oppose hedge funds. I don't oppose short selling. I object to the accumulation of unsettled trades on our financial system. Now look at the effect on a company. I'll show you basic supply and demand curves. Imagine there's a stock with a certain amount of demand out there, a certain amount of supply, and the point where they meet is $40. The miscreant shows up and starts gaming the system. He sends out FTDs. Since the system sees these FTDs as normal stock, he's increasing the supply of stock, of a parent stock. And when you increase supply, you shift the supply curve to the right. He does it again, generating FTDs, shifting the supply line to the right as he goes. Eventually, he shifts the supply line far to the right. Now notice where the supply and demand lines cross. Of course, the price collapses. The $40 stock turns into a penny stock. Most investors think penny stocks are the Wild West. They stay away, so demand dries up. As demand dries up, a ceiling forms over the stock. The FTDs in the upper right started off life as stock IOUs and sincere stock IOUs, but IOUs just the same. Now that it's a penny stock, these FTDs become penny IOUs. Penny stock, penny IOUs. The fellow at the right has the money, the firm's a penny stock. A vicious cycle ensues where the company collapses. Other businesses stay uh, away from the firm. They say, gee, it's a penny stock. Is it going to be around? They stop doing business. Capital markets shun the firm. If you're a penny stock, you can't go into the world and raise capital. So as it loses customers and can't access the market, it can't recover. Society loses the products and technologies that were offered. And because the companies that come under these kinds of attacks are often software and small pharmaceutical companies and high-tech companies, uh, because it's possible to create the most confusion about them. So when the next Microsoft or Genentech is destroyed, society loses those technologies. Shareholder value is wiped out. Jobs are destroyed, not just those today, but those that the company would have created over its life cycle had it not been strangled in its crib. And ironically, the miscreant keeps his cash and often does not even pay taxes for an arcane reason I won't go into here, but he generally gets away without paying taxes. Regulation short sales, or reg show. These threshold lists consist of companies with too many trades that can't be settled because stock is not delivered to the buyer, so-called failures to deliver. I mean, some people use the phrase counterfeit stock to describe the phenomenon, that if you can sell stock and you never have to deliver, it's going to have the same impact as selling, selling, and selling. It's going to push the price down. If you're a short seller and you abide by all the rules governing short sales, then fine. It's legitimate, it's legal, it's proper. That's not what is going on on Wall Street. What's going on on Wall Street in our cases, and we're now seeing in many other companies, is a rigged system.
20,800 percent of our company was traded in a single month. The shares weren't available. They, they, they weren't there. They, there was no way they could be trading. In March 2005, the Senate Banking Committee confronted then SEC Chairman William Donaldson with a story about Frank DeBrookie's company, the Nevada based real estate holding company Global Links. An investor named Robert Simpson had set out to prove that small companies were indeed frequent targets of abusive naked short sellers. Simpson placed an order for $5,000 worth of stock in Global Links. That got Simpson ownership of all 1.1 million Global Link shares in the market. Not some of them, all of them. There were no shares available to be borrowed, and yet in two days there were over 50 million shares traded. That's clearly something that needs, needs work. I was absolutely blown away when I bought 1,282,050 shares which equated to 111 percent of the issued and outstanding. I just couldn't even fathom that. So it wasn't just crooked, it was Wild West times 10. The day all this started, trading in Global Links opened at 10 cents a share. Within a second, the price dropped to a penny. An hour and 16 minutes later, Global Links stock was trading at 8 one hundredths of a penny. Prices dropped 99 percent in less than two hours. So they created something called the DTCC. Now she took a back office of the New York Stock Exchange, and they and they made it a company. And they said this own legally all. I, I love doing this. I when I was fighting this fight in public speeches, I'd say, "Hey, raise your hand if you own any publicly traded stock." And of course, everyone's hand almost everyone goes up. And I would tell them, no, everyone with their hand up is wrong. None of us actually own any stock. Believe it or not, all the stock in America, publicly traded corporate uh, stock is owned. I don't mean just warehoused, but actually owned by a company no one's ever heard of. It owns the stock. And then there are entitlements, contractual right. entitlements. And so you can think of it like a hub and spoke. And at the hub is the DTCC. And then there's there's a there's a certain number, a dozen or so clearing brokers who are directly wired into the DTCC. And then there's a another ring of a couple thousand wired into them. So when I'm buying, when I'm selling you stock and I'm at one broker and you're at another, what's really happening is there's this daisy chain of contractual rights. And all that's happening is different contractual rights are different and these entitlements are moving around. This is a crazy tenuous system. You don't own what you think you do. Believe it or not, the legal ownership is vested in a corporation that, that no one's ever heard of actually owns corporate America. Eventually, the registered brokers of the stock exchange created the Depository Trust Clearing Corporation, or DTCC, which matches buyers and sellers of electronic trades. The DTCC now holds in electronic form all of the accounts of the major brokers. It's actually privately held, but it carries out a public trust. This big computerized entity watches every transaction in the market. Key element was making sure that whenever they hit the button that said the stock gets electronically transmitted, that they had the stock. And that's exactly where the loophole was. Byrne's battle against naked short sellers led him to one of Wall Street's best kept secrets. The Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation, or DTCC. It's just a few blocks from here. On average, the DTCC says it processes more than $1.4 quadrillion worth of trades a year. That's more than 20 times the economic output of the entire planet. The DTCC also keeps track of the trades that can fail due to naked shorting. In the early 90s, Suzanne Trimbath was working for the DTCC. One day, she was approached by some transfer agents who are hired by public companies to keep track of who owns each share of stock. They explained to me, and they helped me to understand that short sales and stock lending increased the number of shares in circulation. 
This meant that during corporate elections, shareholders were voting on more shares than were actually available. In corporate elections, shareholders get a vote for each share of stock. One share, one vote. But because of this overvoting, the transfer agents believed that there were more shares in the market than the companies had issued. Somehow, phantom shares were making their way into the system. They asked me if I would talk with the senior management at DTC to see if they would work with them on a solution. And I went to the senior managers there, and they said that they wouldn't do anything about it because you can't balance the world. And I remember thinking that that wasn't a very good answer. They couldn't keep track of who owned the shares and who had the rights to vote, and they thought it was a, a fairly small problem. Ten years later, Trim Bath, now an economist working in the private sector, was contacted by Wes Christian, a lawyer who was examining phenomenon similar to what she had experienced in 1993. He sat me down at a coffee shop somewhere in midtown Manhattan, and he heard that I used to work at DTC, and he said that he would like to talk with me. And he drew for me on the back of a napkin this idea that he had. He laid out the scenario. It looks as if more shares are being sold than exist. And here's the degree to which we think it's happening. And he laid out the scenario of how the shares were multiplied. And when he did, I just remember being so surprised that an idea that someone had brought to me 10 years earlier was once again being presented to me. Only this time, instead of telling me this is what's happening, he's asking me, is this happening? And so, of course, my answer was yes, this, you're, this absolutely happens. Meantime, Patrick Byrne says he received data from the DTCC that stunned him. On January 12, 2006, Byrne says the DTCC data indicated that there were 7 million more overstock shares in circulation than there should have been, a discrepancy coinciding with the steep decline in the company's share price. DTCC data obtained from the SEC through the Freedom of Information Act also reveal the scope of the failed trade problem. On an average day last March, failed trades amounted to more than 750 million shares in almost 2,700 stocks, exchange-traded funds, and other securities. In all, the DTCC says about $6 billion in trades can't be cleared every day, 1.5% of the total dollar volume. DTCC members include the prime brokerage firms that control the $10 billion annual stock lending market and are responsible for many of the failed trades. The one Former Undersecretary of Commerce Robert Shapiro works as a consultant for lawyers representing alleged victims of naked short sellers. He says as many as a thousand public companies were damaged by naked shorting in the decade it took to get reg show into the rule books. A lot of those companies are gone. A lot of them died. Uh, this was a, a fatal, uh, fatal attack. When a broker executes a trade, they use a clearing firm to make sure the trade settles through the DTCC. They were using the clearing firm, Goldman Sachs Execution and Clearing. They were selling the shares from one account, and they were flipping those shares to another account that had the title flip firm, which that should be a dead giveaway for any regulator, but they really didn't seem to mind that at all. It was a fake trading account used to reclassify the counterfeit shares as real shares to be sold to unsuspecting investors. I've got 50,000 pieces of paper in the garage that show all of the New York banking firms laundering money from the Bahamas through all the New York banks. They use different processes to move it offshore, to laundry it. There were hundreds of investment banking firms offshore just in the Bahamas. Then you have the Cayman Islands. If you have money, you can't just put it in a sock and bury it in the backyard. We have Bermuda. You need somebody to, first of all, wash it. So you need to do it banks overseas. Of course, you have Costa Rica. Um, now Barcelona, Spain is even opening up. On any given day, there are between 500 million and 1 billion shares have been sold and failed to deliver. 
your stock is getting lent to this firm, to that firm, to this firm, to that firm. Each firm gives each other an IOU. But at the end of the day, if everybody went and claimed their stock and said, give me my physical certificates, they would not be able to do it. They operate from an inherent position of conflict of interest uh, in which their owners earn profits off of the transactions of uh, naked short sales. Why would we take an organization that's privately owned and put it in control of $30 trillion a month of transactions with essentially limited supervision? Who owns it? The New York Stock Exchange owns it. All the prime brokers own it. Its members just happen to be Wall Street. The same parties who would have to enforce delivery. And there's been no forced accountability. So the fox is watching the hen house. And the fox is eating all the eggs. The DTCC um, really, in a surprising way, went public very aggressively, denying really their own data, denying the, the phenomenon itself, saying that it really didn't exist. They refused to provide the most basic data regarding naked short sales in their own stocks. It's their job to report that. But their employer is the brokerage house. You have folks that are still, you know, in the industry, and they've been like, I wouldn't advise you to talk about it, ba 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 ba. But I just, I think that they're living, you know, they're, they're all living in kind of a, a fake world. Um, you know, I would, you know, illegally naked short sale stocks every day. Every day. As long as I was collecting commissions. And the bank did not care. The client will send you an order electronically. All you do is you click on the order, you go to execute, it'll pull up a little box, you type in anything you want, and you just hit OK. You don't ask questions. You appreciate the order. And if that involves shorting a stock naked, you do it anyway. Because management essentially tells you just create the business. Anything on the backside, we will deal with. So you're collecting money on the front, you collect money on the back, and you actually have zero risk. Clients never see that. All the prime lenders, they all do it consistently. So in 2016, Goldman Sachs was charged with this clever new way of breaking the short selling rules. They have this whole team of people tucked away in a back office. When a client would call to borrow a stock, the team would use computers to automatically locate stocks they had in inventory. This is normal. You always gotta locate a stock before you loan it because you obviously can't loan something you don't have, right? Well, halfway through the day or so, the inventory could dry up. The system would say, no more shares available, sorry. <laughs> But Goldman was like, ah, fuck that. There must be a secret stash somewhere, right? So they'd say, we have reasonable belief there are leftovers we could locate. And they created a program where when you press the F3 button on your keyboard, poof, it overrides the dried up supply. That's it. Just hit F3 and the computer would say, automatically located, even if it wasn't true. So you could do this as many times as you wanted, magically creating phantom shares that didn't actually exist. But guess who worked in the building right across the street? The S.E. motherfucking C. So, Goldman got caught and paid a $15 million settlement, which in normal person dollars is like, I don't know, like 23 cents. I was doing this, and I wasn't even really kind of aware. All of a sudden, when I was out and I'm sitting in COVID and David and I start talking, I'm like, oh my God. Like, this happens every, everywhere, every day. These people that are doing this have to be put in jail. So the question is, how can we exert pressure to force the Department of Justice and other people that have the ability to put people in handcuffs to actually do it? Finally, under pressure from the SEC, Wall Street, the DTCC, and Treasury, the Senate Banking Committee caved especially when Senate Banking Chairman Richard Shelby weighed in. They also got to Chairman Shelby. Shelby said to Bennett, uh, I think we ought to wait and give the SEC a chance to come in and explain their position. 
And so we were simply the victims of a very effectively executed strategy to make sure that there were no hearings on this and even to make sure that Senator Bennett did not introduce the bill. So the one time that Congress had an opportunity to force the SEC to stop naked short selling in the stock market, they instead sold out to the elusive powers on Wall Street. The gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Hollingsworth, is now recognized for five minutes. Well, good afternoon. I'm excited to be here with each of you. Before I get started on my questions, Mr. Moynihan, I wanted to let you know, Saruthi, raise your hand, Saruthi. She has been my team member for a couple of years now, but on Monday, she becomes a Bank of America team member, about which she is very, very excited. So I hope you'll take good care of her and know and recognize the talent that she has shown already in our office. I'm sure she'll do the same at Bank of America. We will do that, and her father already works for us, so he'll oh, take care of it. You should have called us. <laughs> Um, well, good. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to chat about some of these issues today. What I'm really interested in is the state of the economy. How are you floating your resume to big banks? I mean, you're supposed to be the ones, you know, policing the big banks. I mean, Grow up, Jamie. There must be some kind of law against working for a financial institution right after you've been working in financial regulation, right? No. No. Hey! Doggy! Hey! Come over here. What are you doing at Caesars? He's a Goldman. Yeah. Her father already works for us, so he'll oh, take care of it. You should have called <laughs> us. <laughs> the strategy had two phases. At first, the conspirators lined their pockets by manipulating the price of Eagle Tech's stock up to dump their shares. Now, they schemed to drive the price down. That way, the crooks made even more money as it dropped. And when the loan was due, they would get so many shares of the stock that they would gain control of Rod's company and the technology he had invented. There was no floor in the price of the stock that the Solomon Smith Barney and the Paradigm Group could buy the stock at. So it was to their advantage, one, for the price of the stock to drop because then they could buy the stock at a cheaper price. The lenders found a way to guarantee that the price of the stock would drop by flooding the market with phantom shares. It's called death spiral financing because it ultimately kills the companies under attack. There was large scale naked short sale attacks on hundreds and hundreds of small young companies that had come up in the economic boom of the 1990s. Uh, hundreds of which were destroyed. Patrick also publicly accused Herb Greenberg and Jim Cramer of being crooked reporters. Herb Greenberg, you've been in the game for a long time, longer than I have. How's it feel to be uh, called a crooked reporter on CNBC? Uh, it feels like the person who called me a crooked re uh, reporter on CNBC, uh, Patrick Byrne, mm -hmm. for the third time, has libeled me, has defamed me, has slandered me, is getting in the way of me doing my job. I got the uh, yes subpoena from the government last week, too. Did you? Used my copy, yeah. I got it. You know why I got the subpoena? I got the subpoena because I've said negative things about a stock that I think is going lower. That's why I got that subpoena. After sounding the battle cry of journalistic integrity loudest of all, CNBC star Jim Cramer was seen on the internet telling another journalist how his hedge fund tried to manipulate the market. I have to talk about what it's like at my hedge fund, okay, because, and what other hedge funds do. We have a tape where Kramer's talking about when he ran a hedge fund, how he broke the law. You know, a lot of times when I was short at my hedge fund and I was positioned short, meaning I needed it down, uh, I would uh, create a, um, a level of activity beforehand that could drive the futures. It doesn't take much money. And he's advocating breaking the law and telling people to break the law. It, uh, what you're seeing now is maybe, it probably is bigger market now, maybe you need 10 million in capital to knock this stuff down. But it's a fun game, and it's a l lucrative game. I mean, the SEC won't figure it out, so he's a crook. You Man. can't create a yourself an impression that a stock's down. But you do it anyway, because the SEC doesn't right. understand it. They're sociopaths. They're just absolute sociopaths. What's important when you're in that hedge fund mode is to not do anything remotely truthful because the truth is so against your view right. that it's important to create a new truth to develop a fiction. And um, this is actually just lately illegal. 
He's a crook. Help you quote me on that. Now, passive investing is actually rooted in the theory that markets are efficient and that markets are efficient because of active managers setting the prices of securities. Firms like Citadel, firms like Fidelity, firms like Viking Global, Capital Research. We're all running large teams of people that are engaged in fundamental research, trying to drive the value of companies towards where we think they should be valued. When Patrick's battle began in 2005, Overstock had the revenues and available funding to fight back and was able to survive the onslaught of the media as well as the phantom shares dumped into the market. But Eagle Tech wasn't as lucky. The fraudulent manipulation of Eagle Tech's stock made it impossible for Rod Young to raise capital to fund his company. NBC Dateline interviewed 25 people. They had uh, 75 hours of film. It was scheduled to air. It was confirmed by the producer that it was to air. The Crusaders hoped that after years of being ignored, the burning issue of naked short selling and massive fraud on Wall Street would finally be addressed before a national audience. But instead, Dateline aired a special about American Idol singing star Ruben Studdard. When the story which was scheduled for broadcast suddenly got yanked in favor of Ruben Studdard, it was apparent that something was going on. The gap between uh, what CNBC advertises itself as and what it is. You know, look, we're both snake oil salesmen to a certain extent, I'm not but we do label the show as snake oil here. Uh, isn't there a problem <laughs> selling snake oil as, as vitamin tonic? I think that there are two kinds of people. There are people who come out and they make Good calls and bad calls. The difference is not good call, bad call. The difference is real market and, and unreal market. Let me let me show you. This is is uh, you ran a hedge fund. Yes, I did for many years. You know, a lot of times when I was short at my hedge fund and I was positioned short, meaning I needed it down, uh, I would uh, create a um, a level of activity beforehand that could drive the futures. I would encourage anyone who's in the hedge fund to do it because it's legal right. and it. Um, it's a very quick way to make money. No one else in the world would ever admit that, but I don't care. That's right, and you can say that here. I can't, I'm not going to say it on TV. You know, I understand you want to make finance entertaining, but it's not a game. Don't you want guys like me who have been in it to show the shenanigans? What else can I do? You knew what the banks were doing, and yet were touting it for months and months. And so now to pretend that this was some sort of crazy once-in-a-lifetime tsunami that nobody could have seen coming is disingenuous at best and criminal at worst. I want kangaroo courts for these guys. I really do. I want indictments. We've not seen any indictments. Where are, where's the indictments for AIG? These guys at these companies were on a Sherman's march through their companies financed by our 401k and they burned the house down with our money and walked away rich as hell. In right now include Upstart, that is one, uh, Tesla, MGM, and AIG. Why those four, all of which you've bought within, well, basically this week, except Tesla, uh, end of last month? Yeah, so, well, Upstart's up about 25% just in four days since we since we bought it. We bought it on uh, about four days ago. Uh, so that's actually made a, a nice little move in the uh, short term, probably a little extended right now, but longer term, uh, that, that's a, that's a, a good-looking uh, name. Uh, very powerful, very strong earnings. These stocks are actually What do they do? Really I don't well. even know them. What do they do? Uh, excuse me? What does Upstart do? Uh, well, I'm... I'm, I'm I'm sorry. What kind of company is it? Yeah, I'm not, you're, you're breaking up. Oh, uh, well, sorry I guess we, we've got an audio problem there, Mark. I'm sorry. I do know MGM, I do know Tesla, and I do know AIG, but a 25% move in a week is pretty good for the company Upstart. Uh, thank you, Mark, for your time. We'll have you back soon. Appreciate it. Naked short selling and fraud had destroyed Rod's chances of bringing a new and useful product to the American public. Meanwhile, the same practices were destroying Virogen. Despite extremely positive trials for its key cancer drug, Omniferon, naked short selling had decimated Virogen's stock price. 
it simply didn't have the funding to bring their revolutionary cancer treatments to the market. One of the people who might have benefited from Virogen was one of its most ardent supporters, Darren Saunders. Darren had originally taken to the airwaves to spread the word about naked short selling. But tonight, in his own unique way, the show would be very personal. Good evening. Welcome to Access for All. I'm your host, Darren Saunders. I've been doing shows for about three years about a small cancer company out of, Vi out of Florida, Plantation, Florida, called Virogen. I was diagnosed with colorectal cancer in March. And the last few months have been quite an experience. I went to the doctor, and the doctor told me that I could have one of two things. I could have either colitis or cancer. And when he said that to me, I knew for sure it was cancer because I had pain in my back that was unbelievable. During his crusade against fraud on Wall Street, Darren Saunders was one of the most vocal of the Dirty Dozen. But in 2010, Darren's battle against cancer had finally overwhelmed him. The thing that's so funny about this now, after all of this, and the reason why I've been through so much is because I've been battling for Viagem for so long. So now, after all this time, battling for a company with a cure for cancer, to have cancer beat me, it, that's not a perfect end. That's not a good ending to my film. After 15 years of standing up for what he believed in, Darren Saunders passed away on May 23rd, 2010. Darren was a hero. It's a shame that Darren is gone. Telling me financial institutions, large financial institutions, don't lobby Congress on the but writing of those records. They so absolutely who, they well, lobby. That's what I'm they have, you. They have, they have of course. Uh, an ability to get meetings. Oh, absolutely. So the laws that Congress writes are manipulated and coerced. Those are your words. How are you going to be the, that's, I'm, I'm like talking to a sheriff and I'm like, the drug dealers are out there and you're like, drug dealers, now, come on now, let's not be unfair to them. John, I, you're the cop. I understand that. I understand that. But you also want somebody in my role to be successful at being a cop. Oh, my Lord. So Congress writes the laws. We implement those laws. Yes. Congress lobbied by financial institutions writes the laws. I, I guess ultimately what it comes down to is this. Is the SEC the best system to, to do this? I think the American public kind of gets it, that the system is not mm -hmm. fully working for them. Yes, I believe, a, I believe okay. that's true. All right. I will point out the characteristics of ETFs that make us consider Dean Garrett's charge to think about what might play a role in the next crash. So what would those be? Well, number one, they're a growing force. Five trillion in assets worldwide and growing quickly. In addition to that, they constitute a disproportionate percentage of trading volume. So over our sample period, looking at U.S. ETF products, they're about 5% on average of market cap and yet constitute up, you know, upwards of 25% of trading volume. They're a hybrid, this mutual fund that also has you know, individual stock-like properties. And underlying that hybrid structure is this very unique and innovative liquidity provision mechanism. We have these authorized participants who are looking at imbalances in the supply and demand of these and arbitraging the difference to provide liquidity when it's necessary. Now, that, that in and of itself, that mechanism is truly innovative. At the same time, those same authorized participants are the nexus of many markets. Spot, futures, options, security lending. They might be making markets and ETFs across different asset classes, geographies, industries. So when we think about a possible contributor to a future crisis, we look for points of linkages. And this is a point of linkage across many different asset classes, industries, geographies, and even different types of investors. So the big question we'd really like to answer is, does the increased investment in and trading of ETFs pose a risk for the market? That's a huge question. I will not, unfortunately, answer that question today. However, I will point to one aspect of these ETFs that is concerning to me and point out a, a nuance to how markets are made, this underlying innovative liquidity mechanism for ETFs that I think we should at least be aware of. 
Market makers, or people who purported to be market makers, had an exemption to fail to deliver. Now, what, what is a fail? As I described at the top here, it's a condition where two investors agree upon a transaction. They transact at time t, and then over our sample period with uh, t plus 3 clearing, they don't actually deliver the security at t plus 3 like they're supposed to. So they owe that security. Now, that exemption was allowed for market makers in order to enable liquidity to flow through to the markets, but the paper we published suggested that there were some people abusing that exemption who were doing this failing to deliver not to provide liquidity, but rather to gain access to short position. If we look at the actual dollar amount of fails as of the end of our sample period, ETFs constituted 78% of the dollar volume of fails. And so all of this, once again, just confirmed my initial hypothesis. This is probably naked short selling. They have a desire to do it. There's tons of fails in these things. People just, you know, instead of paying the borrow rate or can't locate the shares, they're failing to deliver. So this is an example. We found this in SEC as we were researching this, trying to figure out how this works. And in a response letter to the SEC, this is an example of an ETF called XRT. XRT is, as probably many of you know, is a consumer retail ETF. So if you have an opinion about consumer retail with the advent of Amazon, it's going up, it's going down, parts of it are going up, going down, this would be a place to manifest that opinion. So what we see, if we look at the shares outstanding, the actual shares created, three different points in time here, December 2011, March 31st, 2012, June 30th, 11 million, you know, almost 13 million, 9.5 million shares of this ETF. At the same time, we can go to the 13F data and see, OK, for 13F institutions, how many shares of this ETF are being held? Well, over those same time periods, there were 77 million shares held, 75 million shares held, and 64 million shares held. And so you think, well, how is that even possible? There's only 11 million shares, but either operational shorting or rehypothecation of those shares means they have been given again and again and again. When Ryan Cohen became part of GameStop, the stock was insanely overshorted. Right now, an astounding 144% of GameStop shares have been sold short. Honestly, I've never seen that. And I picked up the phone and called all my short selling buddies. I said, you ever seen this? They go, no, we've never seen this. We've never seen 100% of these so-called outstanding shares short, never seen it. It was spring-loaded to go up. And that's when I looked at it and I said, oh, this is going to be a real problem for these guys that are short. This is going to be a major short squeeze. What's known as a short squeeze. And a short squeeze is a term that sounds really hard to understand, but it's not that complicated. It's basically when a share price of a certain stock skyrockets very fast, and it causes the people who were betting that that stock would go down in price tons of losses. If the short squeeze happens, the stock will go to infinity practically because, of course, the shorts have to borrow the stock. And once there is no more stock to borrow, they cannot deliver, right? So, and, but they have to, they have, so the broker has to buy in the shorts at any price. There was a very actively involved campaign on behalf of those who were short the stock to you know, hammer the price. Bots spamming negative messages and negative sentiment. If you start seeing that over and over and over and over again, it makes you think there's someone that has a vested interest in forgetting GameStop. It's been a big month for Citadel's Ken Griffin in real estate, the hedge fund manager purchasing the most expensive home ever sold in the U.S. Was thinks that there was collusion, that the big guys, all of you guys, were figuring out how to do this and ultimately come out ahead as you always do. Um, but did you talk to them about restricting or doing anything to prevent people from buying, not selling, but buying in GameStop? Let me be anybody in your organization. Let me be perfectly clear. Absolutely not. So if we depose everyone in your organization, we will find that. That is correct. Okay, thank you. They can massively short a company um, over a period of two to three weeks and then get out of that company, reap enormous profits, and those are profits at the expense of other shareholders. We need to remember that 
40% of the shares on American stock exchanges are held by public and private pension funds. So what we're talking about here are stock manipulators reducing the pensions of tens of millions of teachers, policemen, auto workers, steel workers, nurses, professors, America's large pension funds. What's the overall thinking on these retail investors, though? Is it, are, are they back? Was it a black swan? Is it something You that mean that the, the whole sort of meme stock th phenomenon yeah, meme that, stock. that got Gabe yeah. in trouble in GameStop yeah. last year? Yeah. And, and they took a run at the stock market in, in GameStop and AMC and dozens of other meme stocks. I like to think it was a moment in time. So, I like to think that's the case. It's not how capital formation works best. And frankly, a lot of it came from a place that I don't think it was very healthy, which is like, let's try to you know, take a firm like Melbourne and, and put them into bankruptcy. Like, great. So you, you basically help wipe out the pension plans of teachers. You feel good about that? It's not Gabe's money that you're taking down. You're taking down the money of a pension plan that belongs to a teacher. So I don't, I don't think it, was a very, it wasn't a very good moment in American capital markets history. There's lots of angles here, whether there was insider trading, whether the likes of Robinhood uh, hurt their customers, and whether the likes of Citadel are abusing their power. What, what do you think is the key focus and the likely outcome? So what I would like to point out here, that we have come dangerously close to the collapse of the entire system, and the public is, seems to be completely unaware of that, including Congress and the regulators. So, so let me explain to you that on, on January 26th, game had closed at $77 a share. The following day, it closed at 148 The following morning on January 28th, the stock opened at 355 and traded up to 480 At the same time, game had 50 million registered shares outstanding and the short interest of 70 million shares. In addition, there were about one and a half million calls, which would call for 150 million shares. When the shorts, when, if the shorts, uh, sorry, if the longs repay their margin loans and exercise the calls, their brokers would have had to be, would have been obligated by the rules as they are today to deliver to them 270 million shares while they all, by only 50 million shares existed. So when the shorts cannot deliver the shares, the broker representing the longs must, must, by the rules of the system, go into the market and buy the shares at any price, pushing the price into the thousands. So as the price goes higher, the shorts default on the brokers. The brokers now must cover themselves. They push the price further up. So the brokers default on the clearing houses, and you end up with a complete mess that is practically impossible to sort out. So that's what almost happened. The market maker, in an effort to support now the short seller, uh, Melvin Capital, they will typically borrow the stock, as I think everybody here knows that. They borrow the stock, give it to the short seller. They actually sell it. It never goes to the short seller. Everything stays on the books of the market maker. They sell the stock. They put the cash on their books, memo credit to Melvin Capital, and that's collateral against the short. And that's the typical short selling. But that's not what happened with game stock. It did in the beginning, but when the shorting got out of hand on the hedge fund side of the fence, the market makers created synthetic shorts. And that's a whole other issue, and we can talk about that, but the synthetic shorting and naked shorting, which is illegal, you can, a market maker can do, can execute naked shorts insofar as they're facilitating a trade. They're not to facilitate someone shorting a position for an extended period of time. So the regulators are looking at that now as to whether or not there was this naked shorting by the market makers on behalf of the hedge funds 
in order to facilitate the shorts, and I think they're going to uncover that there were some issues there, which gets me to a final point. I'll give it back to you. The penalty for naked shorting is really not significant enough to stop it. Citadel and Goldman and all of the players get fined constantly for uh, doing this as long as it's not intentional and never is intentional, uh, they get fined. And I think one of the things we need to do is discuss increasing the fines for this lapse of memory and inefficiency in the system to the point where people wake up and pay attention. Right now, the, the, you know, the fines are insignificant. The, uh, not, not that the, re I, as a matter of fact, I, I'm in favor of what, of what the Reddit boys did and girls. Um, they were right in what they did, so I'm not knocking them. And this is coming from a hedge fund manager, so that's... But, but an institution would never push the system that far because the regulators would come down on them and saying, in other words, the question you have to ask yourself, well, why didn't a hedge fund do what Keith Gill did and his followers? because a hedge fund would do that to a certain point and then cut it because the SEC would be in on them. Ah, I see. So when, they, when, the, when the retail players rallied together, there was no, I guess there wasn't a, a single target, or is that why the, I mean, why wouldn't they be, uh, why wouldn't they go after them? Well, you know, if Goldman Sachs tried to execute a short squeeze, they have executive management that at some point would have said, we've made enough money, now cut it out because the SEC will be on our backs, and we don't need those two-bit no good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so that that's important. Whereas the retail guys just said, "Hey, if 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 Plotkin can short, you know, over 100 percent, or Plotkin and his and his cohorts could short over 100 percent of the float, why can't we buy enough calls equal to 100 percent?" of the outstanding or the float. So uh, it, it was an even up playing field, just that the moral compass is different. The hedge funds got a little bit of a moral, more moral compass, not that much more, but a little bit more. Well, and Charles, I think you told me that it, didn't, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize there's a risk of a squeeze when you have over 100% of the, yeah. the, uh, the, the you float know, I was surprised story. when they had the congressional hearing that they didn't, that they, they tried to set the retail side up for a fall but it's really the, you know, the, the hedge fund world. Last January, when brokers shut off the buy button, there was an unexpected consequence. We got a peek behind the curtain of Wall Street, and it turns out naked short selling was just one piece of a completely fraudulent system engineered by the participants betting against retail investors. We all believed that brokers were a trusted intermediary. Then along came Robinhood with the idea of commission-free trading using something called payment for order flow. Now instead of our orders going to exchanges, they were being bought by wholesalers like Citadel who had just internalized the trade and supposedly purchased them from something called a dark pool? An alternative trading system built to prevent volatility from massive block trades was now being used to suppress price discovery from retail purchases. How fucking invincible do you have to feel to name the place where you conduct your least transparent business dealings dark pools? The vast majority of order flow can trade off of exchanges, which is problematic for a number of reasons, not just because of information disparities, but also because that price formation is not really reflective of what supply and demand is. When you place a market order in the U.S., a market order at a retail platform, well over 90% of those trades go straight to the dark market, to a wholesaler that bought that order flow rather than competing trade by trade. It was time to listen to the advice of the woman who literally wrote the book on naked shorting. Now, an individual can still ask to have their shares registered in their own name, right? So, you know, GameStop is, has a um, direct registration, a direct stock purchase program. After some fresh due diligence, we realized if everyone transferred their shares out of brokerages and registered them in their own name with GameStop using the official transfer agent computer share, not only would it prevent shares from being loaned out, but it could kick off the biggest game of musical chairs ever played. So let's recap. Naked short selling is rampant with Wall Street's biggest players who just treat the fines as a cost of doing business. A business where they not only bet directly against us and cheat by suppressing the price, but they even skim our trades and make billions of dollars doing it. A business where when they start to lose, they're willing to take historically unprecedented steps to shut off our access to the market. We're taking our business elsewhere. We're using our own money on this trade. 
Money you worked for. The people betting against us are doing so by leveraging your pension, your 401k. Securities that are supposed to be secure are being used to bet against the most passionate and stubborn group of traders in the history of the stock market. Right now, there's more registered shareholders of GameStop than Microsoft, Google, and Apple combined. If you're a GameStop investor and you have shares in a payment for order flow broker, this video is your warning. If you have shares in a legit broker, this is a plea to help us light the fuse. And if you're a spectator, this is your chance to board the rocket ship. I hope this explains what we're trying to accomplish and why it matters.